So this is just one example of a Baroque bass. It's my Baroque bass rather than the Baroque bass because the Baroque times, which most of us count as being from 1600 to 1750, was actually a very transitional time for bass instruments and is the time when the double bass was born in a way and became part of ensembles on a regular basis. No pun intended, sorry about that. The range of them, might go to about the depth the cello goes to these days or just slightly lower. So one tuning goes to an A, which is here. The lowest string on a cello is about here. And there are other examples of tunings from other parts of Europe that went a whole octave lower than the cello. So from here, from the cello, it went down to a B, A, or a G might be the lowest note, or an F, or an E, or a D, which is where my instrument stops. But there are other records of instruments going down to a C below that, a whole octave lower than a cello. What we do know is that, say, for example, in France, the bass, the double bass, wasn't known until 1700. And there's records of Monteclair, who was a bass player with the French Paris Opera, bringing a double bass over from Italy and using it for the first time in Paris Opera, where it was used for storms, demons, magicians and choruses. Depending on what country, what city you were in, you had different bass instruments. They might have three strings, four strings, five strings, six strings, some of them. They, some of them are described as being human sized, but then how big were humans in those days? Um, some of them were smaller. Now this bass, I feel very lucky to have it. it is an Italian instrument and it is an old Italian instrument at one point it was thought to be made in 1600 that's been revised by repairers since and the latest information I have is that it could have been made in the end of the 1600s so very late 17th century instrument and you can see from the look of it that there are lots of repairs to the body it's had lots of cracks along the way but on a double bass, we manage to survive with those. Somehow the sound is okay, whereas on a smaller instrument like a violin, that might be disaster. I mean, I don't know if you can pick out the detail, but here you can even see a sort of arrow shape. You can see how a bit of wood has been inserted. I don't know if violins could cope with that, but double basses somehow do. One, this is smaller. I don't know many of my modern bass colleagues that would consider this a big enough instrument for a modern orchestra. As, as orchestras and other ensembles have developed, you know, just think of pop bands, the main emphasis on development has been greater projection, greater volume, being able to reach more people at once in bigger venues and being able to impress people. There's, there's something really impressive about the feeling of sound as well as the sound of sound. And you really get that with a double bass. Quite often when we take them into schools, especially with children who might have um, hearing impairment, um, we ask them to put their hands on the bass. You really feel the vibrations. You often feel them through the floor. So although the pitch of a double bass is quite low and might be outside some people's natural, comfortable hearing range in terms of pitch, you can feel it. It adds a feeling and a depth and a colour to an ensemble. So it is smaller. The other difference is the fingerboard is shorter. So there is no solo repertoire for Baroque double bass, or certainly none that I have found. It is not a solo instrument. We rarely have to play anything that goes higher than this part of the instrument. So we don't need a long fingerboard for playing high harmonics and whizzing around. We just don't need it. Instead of the nice shiny metal, what you can probably see is that they look quite a dull brown colour. And you might see how they're twisted. So they do actually look like string. And that's because that's how they're made. It is made of sheep gut that is twisted and twisted and stretched and washed, of course, um, to make strings. That's what they would have had in the Baroque times. That's what they would have played on. And so that's what we do as well to recreate the sound that we might have heard in the Baroque world. Um, there's a wonderful description of how gut strings are made 
on the um, Gamut website, Daniel Larson, who makes strings, um, has gone into quite a lot of detail. So don't read it over your lunch because it could make you feel a bit ill. But he's also included a lovely chart of how many guts go into a string. And uh, he has said that it could be that up to 32 sheep were needed to make this string. Another string maker, Nick Baldock, who works in Germany, has said a whole hillside of sheep goes into making the bottom string, one as thick as this. So obviously you need more sheep, you need more space, you need more wood to make double bases. So perhaps there weren't so many around and they're not as easy to experiment with as maybe smaller instruments are. Um, the advantage of the gut strings or the difference with gut strings is that they've got a warm and softer quality to them and there's more width to the sound if that makes any sense rather than a narrow sort of projection of sound there's a band of sound um, what I find with some of the students I teach when they're making the first move onto Baroque bass is that their first reaction is one of horror because what you get under the ear, you get quite a bit of rasp from the string. You don't get an even smooth tone that you get from well-made modern strings. But that doesn't carry too many feet. So when you're in the audience, you don't get that rasp. You just get this lovely warm sound world. All cellists I know and all violinists I know will have some sort of overhand hold on their instrument. But in the bass world and in modern orchestras too, you will see some using the French over the top method and you will see some using the German with a deeper frog. This bit's the frog here with a deeper frog and their hands at the side. And each will argue that theirs is best, but that's that's for another time. So what you see on this bow is that compared to a modern bow, the tip is narrower and therefore lighter. There's less wood. So this is the heavier end and this is the lighter end. And that means that it's easier to play stronger at this end and quieter at this end. I'm exaggerating for effect, of course. Um, but that is an inequality that in our style of playing Brook music, we will used to exploit. So rather than trying to override it all the time, we use that inequality to our advantage and as a form of expression. Uh, the other thing on a modern bow you'll see is a metal band holding the hair flat and that helps keep the hair taut and it helps you give more of an attack at the start of your note. We don't have that so attack has to be made with the fingers and with the arms instead. One of the first pieces where there's actually a line written for the violone as opposed to general bass, it's written for the contrabass, is in a piece, um, an opera by Marais, and it is for a storm. So where you would have the cellos playing this, what you get is the contrabass adding and okay by today's Hollywood standards that's not much of a storm but to the ears of the people of that time that would have made a big difference. Um, it brings gravitas to choruses and what you find in some choruses, especially um, in Handel and maybe some later Bach, um, I'll play a bit from the B minor mass, is that the contrabass or the violone is added when the bass singers sing. So not with the tenors, we leave that to the cellos or the violas, but when the bass comes in, then they join. So you might have this with the tenors. <laughs> If you add the double bass to that, you immediately get this extra depth in sound. The 
beginning of the Matthew Passion, for example, is one of my favourite bass lines. I'm, I'm a simple soul and I really love pedal notes on a double bass. So the beginning of the Matthew Passion is a great example of the gravitas that you get of adding 16 foot to a pedal. And as I say, on its own, it doesn't sound like anything much, but when you combine that with the organ and the cellos and the bassoons, that adds a real richness. Maybe it's like the umami of Continuo. <laughs> 